Uh, Dr. White, you said that uh, the missionaries did not come in Acts 15 to see Peter, but the apostles and the elders. Right. I would direct you to Acts 15, which says that in the first verses that they are in discussion, and for the next verses from verses 1 to 11, Peter is addressing the Council of Jerusalem, and only he is speaking. And it was for the very purpose that the missionaries came to the Council of Jerusalem to get a decision on whether Gentiles needed to be circumcised. And Peter gave that decision that they don't have to be circumcised. So I would ask you why you insist that they didn't come to see Peter, they came to see the apostles and elders, and what distinction that I would call distinction without a difference really means. Okay. Uh, 15.2 says, uh, Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue, which was the citation that I was quoting. I think you just said Peter spoke from 1 to 11. He actually speaks from 7 through 11. And then I would respond by saying that if he gave the decision, there was no reason why, beginning at verse 12, the people keep silent listening to Paul and Barnabas as they then relate their experiences in God sending the uh, gospel to the Gentiles and why it is that then James is the one who gives his judgment using the imperative voice uh, and in point of fact this council is under his direction and not Peter's direction. Uh, and so that is the, the uh, brief biblical basis for the comment that I made, but specifically verse 2 is what I was referring to just a few moments ago in my uh, comment. All right, let me follow up with that. Um, in, um, Peter is not an apostle, is he not? Yes, he is one of the apostles. Okay, so would you agree that they also came to see Peter? Yes, to all the apostles and elders, yeah. Okay. Uh, would you agree that the subject material now changes in verse 12 when that Peter or Paul and, the, and Barnabas start talking about their missionary activity and also that the subject has changed when James starts to speak about something other than what Peter declared about circumcision? No, I do not believe that there is a change at all, uh, only in the sense that beginning of verse 12, when Paul and Barnabas speak, they are confirming uh, the statements of Peter. There is a harmony that exists between all of the apostles. And when James gives his judgment using the imperative uh, voice in the Greek language, I think he is the one who is summing up the, the information that has been presented from a number of sources, but we're only given two and that is verses 7 through 11 where Peter speaks, and verses 12 and following where uh, Paul and Barnabas speak. Two issues. One is um, you said that they confirmed Peter's declaration. What does that mean? Uh, that means that they demonstrated through the retelling of their missionary efforts the fact that God had in fact poured out his blessing upon the ministry to the Gentiles, which is a confirmation of uh, what uh, Peter himself has said uh, in those uh, verses uh, 7 through 11 that you've already looked at. And doesn't that not tell us that Peter made a declaration and they are agreeing to that? Uh, certainly. He makes a declaration that the gospel is a gospel of grace and they are saying that they have themselves been declaring that gospel of grace and that God has blessed that gospel of grace by pouring his spirit out upon uh, the Gentiles who embraced in it. Thank you. Embraced it, I'm sorry. In uh, verse uh, 13, you make an issue about the imperative voice when James says, listen to me. Mm -hmm. If I said to you, James, listen to me, does that mean that I have authority over you? Well, I think it is a combination. I think many exegetes, both uh, Catholic and Protestant, would see that uh, both uh, the statement, brethren, listen to me, using the imperative, and then verse 19, therefore it is my judgment uh, that we do not trouble those, that the two together is very indicative of the individual who is leading the council. We know that James was, in fact, uh, the one who was in leadership in the church in Jerusalem. And I don't see any F evidence whatsoever in Acts chapter 15 uh, that P Peter either led this council uh, or that anyone uh, treats him as anything other than an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did anyone make the decision that circumcision was no longer to be required of the Gentiles other than Peter? Uh, they all agreed with it, no, but he's the one who stated it. Okay. Mm -hmm. did, did, did anybody raise an objection to the fact that he singly gave that dogma? I don't know if anyone raised an objection because it's not recorded. Uh, it's only until verse 12 that we hear all the people kept silent. Uh, there does seem to be uh, some discussion that was going on, especially with what Paul says in Galatians, but it is not recorded for us. Wouldn't it be rather audacious for Peter to assume this position if it was not expected of him to do so? 
No, since uh, the, the apostle is simply uh, proclaiming what had been revealed to him in the vision on the, on the housetop. And they pass the clock. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Sengenis, uh, going to your presentation drawn from Matthew chapter 16, uh, you would agree with the statement that I made that when Jesus says, I will give you the keys, that this is in the future tense? Sure. Uh, when did Peter receive these keys? It doesn't say, and it's irrelevant. The point is, in fact, that he would receive the keys. Okay. Do you believe he received the keys along with the other apostles in Matthew 18? Uh, well, it doesn't say whether they received the keys then either. Okay. So is it your position that the scripture never records for us the singular reception of these keys to Peter and Peter alone? Well, it doesn't say it in Matthew 16 or Matthew 18. I would suggest that other passages like Acts chapter 2 and the whole book of Acts more or less basically tells us that these keys had indeed been distributed to the apostles by the descent of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, in, you mentioned Luke chapter 22, and you talked about the singular uses there. Uh, would you agree that in Luke chapter 22 that Peter had in a singular way denied Christ publicly? Yes, but that's not the criterion for infallibility. Okay. Uh, does the scripture ever refer to the word infallibility in regards to Peter? Uh, yes, I claim that Matthew chapter 16 does. If uh, he binds and God says that he binds because Peter bound, and God can't lie, well, God's infallible. So that must mean that what Peter binds and God binds, uh, what Peter bound must be infallible because otherwise God couldn't bind it. So binding and loosing in your uh, perspective is synonymous with the teaching of a doctrine regarding faith and morals? Yes, partly. Okay. Uh, is it your position that the apostles, all of the apostles believed in the doctrine of the infallibility of Peter and his successors? Yes. Okay. Uh, is this then been the universal belief of the church from the days of the apostles? Yes. Okay. Uh, when you indicated early on uh, in, in your last response that uh, scripture is never given as the standard upon which uh, truth is to be determined, uh, in Acts chapter 17, when Paul preaches the gospel uh, in Berea, and uh, the Bereans are commended for their searching of the scriptures to see whether the proclamation of the apostles was true. Was that a good action on their part or a bad action on their part? <laughs> Have you stopped beating your wife? Um, that was a good action, and I'll have to explain it to you, because uh, when Paul introduces the whole subject to them, he's the one who's interpreting the scriptures for them. And as a matter of fact, those very scriptures that he pointed to did not say that the Messiah was Jesus. And that's the controversy that's happening here. Uh, the only way that they know that it's Jesus is because Paul reveals it to them by a special revelation, because it's nowhere in Scripture. So they could have searched the Scriptures till they were blue in the face. They would never have found the name of the Messiah, and that's the issue at stake here. So what does it mean in verse 11 when it uh, says that they were examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so? Because Paul had just told them that the Messiah was Jesus, whom they had crucified, and they wanted to see if the very passages that Paul pointed to, namely Isaiah 53, in fact did measure up to the crucifixion of Jesus, and they found it to be true. So what they did is confirm what Paul told them, that Jesus was the Messiah, by going back to the Scriptures daily and finding that, yes, he is exactly telling us the truth by the revelation God gave him. How would someone today be able to apply this Berean test, which is commended, to a doctrine such as the bodily assumption of Mary? Well, you can open up the Bible and look in Revelation chapter 12. That's where uh, Pius the 12th told us to look, and that's where Paul the 6th said that they got the teaching from. So there are very many allusions to the assumption of Mary. I would grant you that it's not explicit, but there's no teaching in Scripture that it has to be explicit in order to be true. So a person could turn to Revelation chapter 12 and the, the woman closed with a with the son, what, do you happen to know what the earliest interpretation of that passage in church history was? Earliest interpretation? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's many interpretations to that passage in early history. There, and and is not, could... not the earliest uh, that this is representative of the church? 
Yeah, that's one of them. There's another early one that said it was E. There's another one that said it was Mary. There, there's okay. all kinds of interpretations. All right. So it is your position then that it, there is a equality between what the Bereans did in Acts 17 and what someone could do today in looking at Revelation chapter 12 and seeing the bodily assumption. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think it's a very good parallel because Scripture didn't tell the Bereans the identity of the Messiah, and that was their problem. They didn't know who he was. And Revelation 12 doesn't tell us the identity of the woman, but the church does, and Paul did the same thing to the Bereans. He told them that Jesus was the Messiah. 